Welcome to another conversation on democracy from the campus of Washington and Jefferson College. Our guest today is Carrie McBride, member of the W&J Class of 89 and a long-serving executive with the United States Department of State. Carrie is with us today for our fifth annual Symposium on Democracy and has participated in a program where we've talked about the fall of democracy in Afghanistan. Carrie, welcome back to campus. Thank you very much. It's, it's a lot of fun to be here. <laughs> well, we've certainly learned a lot from you today. And I just wanted to recap some of what we talked about in the earlier program today for benefit of those who may be watching this segment. And in particular, to get you to reflect a little bit on the experience that you had right after 9-11 when you, representing the Department of State, went to Afghanistan to help open the U.S. Embassy there, which ultimately launched our 20-year experience of occupying Afghanistan and attempting to build a democratic state. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny having reflected over the last couple of weeks prior to coming up here on those, those days, right, um, how what an impact they really had on me. So um, I was working in Washington, D.C. on 9-11, on um, you know, at the, at the risk of sounding a little, you know, corny or whatever, my, my country was attacked. Um, and we all sort of, you know, were floundering about a little bit. Um, and then there was the opportunity to, uh, to go into Afghanistan and to sort of re-establish re our embassy. Um, and so I, I raised my hand and I volunteered and I ended up in Afghanistan in Kabul in January of 2002. So we, we had uh, taken Kabul, we, the you know, U.S. military and our, and our allies had taken Kabul in December. And so then I went in, in in January and sort of helped reestablish the embassy. Um, you know, and it's, um, I, I sort of remember opening up a, a refrigerator and inside was new Coke. Remember new Coke from the 1980s, right? So clearly it had been, it was, to me it was a miracle that the embassy was untouched in all of those years. and newspapers, you know, still sitting out um, on the on the desks, but we sort of went through and, and really reestablished that. Um, and at the time, um, and I had I had some interaction with the local Afghans, you know, there were people who were, you know, working with us at the embassy. Um, and at the time, it was just uh, so much hope and so much um, relief almost on their part. And, um, you know, I was mentioned earlier, one of the Afghans I worked with had a number of sisters, and he was just so excited because they could now go to school. Um, and what I hadn't really realized or thought about, I guess, was that they're, they're all going to be in the same class because they're all starting with the same education level because they hadn't been able to go to school for so long. Um, and, and, um, and at the time, it was... Um, fairly safe. Uh, you know, I'm not going to pretend that there weren't skirmishes, but Kabul itself was, was a fairly safe place to be. And um, I could drive around by myself, which probably in, you know, hindsight, now that I'm older and wiser, was not the smartest thing to do. Um, but it, it culturally, nobody seemed to mind. And, if, you know, and um, there was when I first went in, there was a lot of sort of question about how are you going to succeed as a, as a woman in Afghanistan, um, and that was never never a problem. Um, and I I sort of joke it's also because I was in in charge of sort of payroll, and so maybe usually the person in charge of payroll nobody ever has a problem with, right? Um, but I I found the people I worked with very open and accommodating, um, and really welcomed me sort of. Um, and I think it's for them. Um, not just me, obviously, there are many of us out there, um, but they're not here in this interview. Um, but I think it really was this opportunity of, okay, we've got our country back, we can make something of it, let's go, and, and let's move forward. Um, and so it was just such a, such a wonderful time to be there. Um, and there really was, when, I, when I, they sort of offered me the job, um, there was, at the beginning, there was no question that I would go. And I was there for about six weeks. And then I came home and I said, you know, okay, I've done my duty. I'm a great American. And they're like, no, actually, could you go back now for another year? And I um, had this conversation and, and um, with the lady who kept sort of pushing me to go back. And I said, but you need somebody with a lot more experience than me, right? Like, I, I don't know that much. Uh, you need somebody with more experience. It's a big embassy. We've got to set all this stuff up. And she said, Carrie, all of that might be true, but I would rather have somebody with the right attitude. And, um, and you know, now that I'm older and wiser and looking back, I know exactly what she meant because 
nothing ever went right. <laughs> you know, you'd put all of your energy into some sort of project and, um, and it wouldn't go right. And I would sort of shrug my shoulders and I'd get a good night's sleep and I'd say, okay, let's try again tomorrow, right? Um, and looking back on it and sort of looking at different points throughout my career, um, how often, I mean, you gotta have some smarts and some capability, but how much sort of attitude really, really can help play a part in that, so. That's great advice for our students yeah. and for all of us, really. Um, our theme for this symposium is why democracies fail, recognizing that far more democracies have failed historically than succeeded. Yeah. Democracies under great stress today in the world. And your, your role at the State Department encompasses the whole world in many ways, and you've had an opportunity to gain perspective on democracies and, and attempts to establish democracies in places beyond Afghanistan. What have you learned from your experience about what it takes for a democratic uh, government and society to um, flourish? Um, what are the, the uh, critical success factors for democracy and democratic institutions from your perspective? So, um, you know, having been, been raised an American with all of the, the rights that we take for granted, frankly, um, and then having, you know, I, I traveled overseas quite a bit um, as a child with my father and his career, but we were pri primarily in sort of strong democracy, democratic countries. <laughs> I got the words all backwards. Um, but, you know, and then um, when I was, one of my very first trips as, uh, as an officer in my own right, I ended up in um, Bamako, Mali. I think it was 1991, um, and Bama, uh, Mali had just had a coup, and so they had gotten rid of the, the dictator, and they were trying to establish a democracy, right? So the United, here we swoop in, and we say, okay, this is perfect. We're going to be here, and we're going to establish democracy. Um, and so what you initially had was, you know, everybody and their brother wanted to start their own party. Um, and so since I was sort of the newest person on the block, I was sort of in charge of the de chatting with the, the parties that probably were not going to amount to anything, right? But finding out what their platform was, what were their asks of the government. Um, and then the more, the, the people who sort of knew what they were doing took on the more established parties. Um, but that was very eye-opening, that the fact that there could be a democracy with more than just sort of two parties. And that um, these are people who are really trying to come in and they all, they all wanted to do good. They all wanted the, what was best for their country. And then I remember traveling out to one of the uh, villages and sort of talking to some of the people in the village about the importance of democracy and why this is wonderful. And the man just kept looking at me. He said, I will, I will go ahead and I will vote for the village. They don't all need to leave the village to go vote. And we said, no, that it's one person, one vote, right? Um, and he said, and it, I mean, it, a naive on my part, right? And he said, if everybody in the village leaves, we're going to have no farming's going to get done that day. Nobody's going to go get the water that day. And all of these, these things that, you know, I have always taken for granted, right? You turn this knob and water comes out. Well, no, when you're living in a village in West Africa, sometimes you have to walk two miles and get water and bring it back. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, and so over the years, you know, reflecting back on that that story and that conversation I had with him, thinking um, how you actually need to have some some basic necessities need to be in place, right? And as I was sort of thinking yesterday in preparation for this about what, what do you need before democracy can work, what else do you need, right? And infrastructure is, is almost at the top of the list. Um, and people need to be informed. I, I, earlier I used the word educated, but I think it's actually, it's, you know, it's educated and, and informed about what, what you're voting for and what you're voting on. Um, as we saw in our own election this year, technology is, plays a huge part in, in a democracy. And it's, so a lot of it is just sort of these, these basic things that I think we, we forget, right? And then, and then once you have a democracy, you need strong leadership. And I think that's also something we have seen, right, is the, um, and, and, you know, I, I look back on George Washington and think to myself, you know, he, after a certain number of years, he said, nope, somebody else's turn, right? And that you need somebody like that. Somebody who can say, all right, I've taken it here, and now it's time to pass it on. And I think that's probably also 
right? A little bit of where democracies fail. You sort of, you, you put people into power and, you know, they start to enjoy it and, you know, it starts surrounding themselves with like-minded people and then all of a sudden, you know, the, the democracy part of it all has, has sort of fallen off to the side. I led a retreat for 20 college presidents in South Africa some years ago and we were talking about how to develop the kind of leaders that we need for the future, yeah. and particularly in South Africa, but the same principles apply. And Archbishop Tutu was with us, and we had long discussions about all the attributes and qualities of good leaders and how are, which of those are developmental, how do colleges and universities contribute to that. And, and um, Archbishop Tutu said, one of the most important is to be a person who's willing to hold power lightly and to know when it's time to let go. Yes. And he used the example of um, Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe, who never let go right. <laughs> for the right. rest of his life, but, yeah. but a very good lesson. Well, I really do want to express our thanks for the well, role you. that you've played in this year's symposium and for being willing to share your insights and your personal experience with us. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, obviously a, a great pleasure. I always enjoy coming back, but I, I will say it really has been a, a great honor, right, to, to be able to come back here into an institution that really helped you know, form a lot of, of who I am and, and has played a part in my success, obviously. I, I always say a strong education at WJ taught me to read and write and think, right? And well, it's our honor to have graduates like you who are willing to continue to give back to your alma mater. We've been talking with Carrie McBride at this year's Symposium on Democracy at Washington and Jefferson College.